Exodus chapter 34 and verse number 6. Exodus chapter 34, verse number 6. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Uh, and we talked a little bit last week about um, God's will in light of his attributes and, and spoke on some of those things. Today, uh, we want to begin looking at this subject of the nature of, of God's patience. And, and we won't be able to cover all of this today. We'll, we'll cover some things today, and then in a future lesson, we'll get a little bit more detailed um, in looking at some different scenarios. Uh, but the scriptures present to us that, that God uh, is one of patience. He is shown as one who has a willingness to, to defer, to defer um, speedy action, to defer uh, quick wrath upon a sinful creation. And what we want to do is just begin looking at this today and see what we can learn um, concerning the nature of God's patience. So that'll be our first point. Uh, the nature, okay, the nature of God's patience. Just to cover a couple of highlights here, first of all, we want to say first that um, God's patience is slightly distinguished from His mercy. Uh, they're connected. They're, they're often linked together, uh, His mercy and His patience or His long-suffering, uh, but they are distinguished a little bit. Mercy views man as miserable, Right. That's that's how mercy views man as, as a miserable and views him in his wretchedness. Patience, though, though, deals with more man as um, criminal in, in the wrong. Um, mercy pities the sinner. Patience deals more with bearing, um, bearing or being long suffering with him in his sin. So so while the two are connected, there, there is a distinction um, Stephen Charnock called patience the first whisper of God's mercy. We would also say that God's patience is not based on any weakness within himself. Let's turn to Psalms number 50. Psalm number 50. Psalm 50. God's patience is not based on any weakness within himself. It's not that God is not capable of anger. Uh, it's not that God is ignorant of what's going on. Uh, one writer, I think it was Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3, um, mentioned that it's not that God is slack concerning his promises. Um, God knows, and we can have every assurance that God will act. But it does tell us here in Psalm 50, in verse 21, these things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as thyself, right? But I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. The fact that God did not act, or the fact that there were times when God was silent, was not any indication at all, and he would have us know that. There wasn't, there wasn't any indication that God was not aware you know, the, the fact that, that God did not always act immediately or the fact that they were not able instantaneously see instantaneously to get a response or an action or an answer from God, whatever the case may have been. Um, he said, all of these things that I was done and I kept silence, but I will reprove thee. OK, the, there's no there's no caution. There's no worry there that that there's any weakness of God that his patience is based upon any lack of knowledge, that his patience is, is based upon any, any weakness or imperfection in himself. Now, I compare that to us, right? We as individuals, and, and certainly I think the famous verse for this would be the book of Galatians in chapter 6, uh, but we, uh, you and I are often encouraged to be patient with people because we share a similar nature with them, right? Galatians chapter 6 in verse 1, the Bible says that if a brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. 
You and I both know the importance of having patience with each other. And a lot of times our long suffering and patience with each other is built upon our, our, our mutual capacity, right? We understand each other. We understand at times what each other is going through. We understand each other's weaknesses. And I'm going to deal with you in patience sometimes because I would consider myself, right? If I see somebody mess up or if I see somebody in error, I see that there's something that's wrong. A man that can consider himself and think, you know what, I'm not above that happening to me. I can absolutely understand and see where they're coming from. That, that, that sometimes is a prod for us to be more patient with each other, right? More long-suffering. God is not like that. God's patience with men is not because, well, he understands where you're coming from. You know, you and I are patient with each other because we can look at each other and say, yep, I know what that's like. I've been there before. Um, you would look at God's patience and you wouldn't have any other understanding other than it is just a direct act of his goodness. God is not patient with men because he understands where they're coming from or because that's, you know, because that's an, we know that it's not an excuse, but you and I certainly, when we look at each other and we see each other in, in, in the light of our own nature, we're patient with each other. That's not why God's patient with us, right? Uh, God is patient with us out of his own goodness and not because of any weakness or comparative nature that he has with his creation. I would say this, thirdly, his patience ultimately reveals his great power. Men by nature are weak. One way that we, uh, one way that weakness displays itself is in the control of our passions. Let's read a couple of verses. Turn to the book of Proverbs in chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16, and then in verse number 32. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. So as I said before, one way that weakness displays itself in man is in the, in the control of our passions. The weaker a person is, the less control he has over his passions, okay? The weaker a person is, the less control he has over those passions. This verse here explains to us, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. Uh, of a similar nature, uh, Proverbs chapter 25. Proverbs chapter 25, just over a couple of pages. In verse 28, it says, he that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Um, men who can't control their passions are, are weak. They, they are weak men. Um, God has such control in his own nature that, that um, you know, the old confession spoke of God, spoke of a God without passions. Um, Lately, and I would say probably over the last 20 years or so, there's been this almost revival uh, of the doctrine of impassibility or, or that, that idea that God, that God is a God beyond or a God is a God without passions. Uh, he is not spoken of as ever being out of control uh, in his nature. You and I are subject to that, right? You and I are subject to passions that, that leave us with the inability to control. God is not like that. In fact, the exercise of his patience is actually a great argument for his ultimate power. In the book of Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter number 9, And it's verse 22, Romans chapter 9, verse 22, where it says, What if God, willing to show 
his wrath and to make his power known endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. In fact, God's patience or God's long suffering ultimately do reveal his great power. You know, you and I, uh, you know, we look at the power that we have and you and I can see that even in, within our own nature, we lose control, right? Um, God never loses control. God's patience uh, or the fact that God is, is long-suffering or the fact that God sometimes defers his wrath to a future date, the fact that God does not instantaneously respond or react to every situation uh, is a great argument for his ultimate power. Um, I would say this, when you talk about God's patience, we want to remember that no other attributes threaten his patience and his patience doesn't threaten any of his other attributes. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let's look at a couple of those attributes. God is truth, right? And God's truth in, let's say, you know, the threatening of punishment. You know, God sent, um, God sent prophets to nations to threaten punishment um, for their lack of repentance, for their lack of recognition of the holy and one God. God um, threatened punishment himself to Adam and Eve. We're going to look at that here in just a little bit. Um, but God's truth in threatening punishment is not violated if he waits to carry that out. Okay? Um, God's, you know, God's truth is not harmed if he's patient. Um, God's patience doesn't disagree with his justice or his righteousness. We read in our text... And let's read a couple of these verses that, that show us this by way of comparison. Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. You could come, you would read those verses and you would come away thinking that there, are, there is no challenge to each other within God's attributes, right? His patience, his long suffering is not a threat to his justice or his righteousness. There are times that it works that way with us. Sometimes you and I, through the exercise of our patience, uh, we, we may eventually become forgetful. Or um, we may find through the exercise of our patience that our wrath was not holy and righteous when it first entered into our mind. And later that patience subdues or wears down um, the wrathful thoughts that we had. God's attributes are not a challenge to one another. You could have one verse say that God is gracious and long-suffering and that he's merciful, and the same writer could come right back behind that in the very next verse and say, but he's also a God that he's not going to acquit the wicked. He does visit the iniquity upon, upon those that execute it. Um, this, these similar thoughts, look in the book of Nahum, uh, the prophet Nahum, chapter 1. Nahum chapter 1, and of course, this prophet came several years, you know, quite a few years actually, after Jonah had been there, and Jonah had preached repentance to Nineveh, and they had repented. And what God had promised in, in their promised vengeance or their promised judgment, he stayed that. He didn't execute that. Now, sometime later, years later, in fact, the prophet Nahum must come back. Notice in Nahum chapter 1, verse 2, God is jealous. The Lord revengeth, the Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. 
you would never walk away from scriptures. If, if you've looked at them reasonably and just taken them in light of what they speak, you would never look at God's attributes as being a challenge to, to, to another one, right? You would never honestly look at a God who is patient, who is long suffering, who, who endures and bears the sins um, of his creation. You would never, you would never look at that patience and say, that that was a challenge to his righteousness, right? Or a challenge to his justice. Right here in one verse, the Lord is slow to anger, great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. There is no harm in seeing in the same verse, when you look at the character and the nature of God, he is one that is of great patience, great long suffering. He's slow to anger, but he's absolutely righteous. He doesn't acquit the wicked. So, so keep that in mind. Patience doesn't disagree with his justice or his righteousness. Um, patience doesn't disagree at all with God's wisdom. In fact, it, it sheds light on God's wisdom. In the book of 2 Peter chapter 3, if you'll turn there, 2 Peter chapter 3, we trust that God, even in the exercise of his patience, uh, is all wise. He knows what he's doing, that God has an appointed um, time in which he plans and purposes to do things. Um, we trust that God has his reasons. If God doesn't act, if God is patient, if God is long-suffering, we trust that God has his reasons, right? You and I have reasons that we do things. Um, you know, judges in this world, you know, if if you had someone that had a proposed court case and you had a judge that looked at something reasonably and, you know, for good reason, perhaps would postpone a trial or a sentencing. Um, if they had justified reasons for that, you would look at that and you think, OK, that's that's reasonable. If, if we in earthly things um, have our reasoning and our justification, we trust that the mind that is all wise and all knowing has reasons for his patience. In 2 Peter chapter 3, we are told that. This is, we've, we've mentioned this several times here recently, but of course, 2 Peter chapter 3 is the passage where it's told for us about the scoffers and the mockers that come, particularly in the last days, but, but they've always existed, right? That, you know, you guys have been promising this forever. You guys have been preaching the judgment of God. You guys have been preaching. Where's the promise of his coming? All things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. You guys keep promising this. You guys keep talking about this. And then it's never happened. Things never change. Everything stays the way that they have always been. But then 2 Peter 3, verse number 9, tells us, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness, right? Isn't that what we've mentioned before? When you make promises... The more time passes, the less likely I am assured that you will keep your word, right? That's just the nature of men. When you make a promise and you don't, you don't fulfill it somewhat immediately or within the time that you promised, the more time passes, the less likely, right? I let somebody borrow, you know... Uh, I'll let somebody borrow a few bucks 20 years ago. Am I getting that money back? No, I'm not getting that money back, right? Um, I made the kids a promise. You know, hey, we're going to try to do this um, this weekend. Well, that was a couple years ago. So you know what? That, that, that's probably long gone from everybody's mind. I, and I'm not thinking of a specific scenario there. I'm, I'm just thinking in generalities. But if we look at each other that way, you would be wrong to look at God that way. Because that's what it says. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You say, well, God's been, you know, you guys have been preaching the second coming of Jesus Christ for how long? Well, God, don't worry. God's not slack concerning that. There's actually a very, one, one very specific reason why he hasn't returned. What is that? Um, 
He's not willing that any of his should perish, but that they should all come to repentance. We look at those verses and we trust, you know what, if Jesus Christ hasn't returned yet, there must be at least a number of people out there that are still yet unredeemed, right? We would look at that and say, well, that would make perfect sense. That's, that's absolutely logical to see, you know, of course God is patient. God still has a plan and a purpose for the current world, which is why he hasn't returned yet. God's patience would never be a challenge to his wisdom. So, so don't, um, don't ever think that patience could threaten his other attributes or vice versa. Okay, that's the nature. And, and those are just some thoughts um, that I wanted to introduce as we talk about this subject and topic over a couple of weeks uh, about the nature of his patience. Um, number two, let's look at God's patience manifested. We're going to look at a couple of general scenarios here in the scripture this morning. And then in a future lesson, we're going to kind of even get more specific about different types of scenarios. But let's look in Genesis chapter 2. First of all, of course, we would look at Adam and Eve to see God's patience manifested. Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 17, familiar passage where it says that of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Punishment was threatened and in partial and partial fulfillment. Adam and Eve, they died spiritually when they ate of that fruit. But in reality, Adam, in, uh, Adam lived another 900 some odd years after these events. He continued to, um, to live, to, to fulfill this uh, to fulfill the command that was given to fill this earth, replenish it. Uh, God allowing the human race to continue to this day is a testimony to his patience, right? There's not a person that lives that, that, that could say that God has not been greatly long suffering or patient when God would have been totally justified or God would have been perfectly righteous at the first scent, right? Of, of, uh, of sin, God's patience is shown to the Gentiles. In Romans chapter 1, Paul just goes through a, a list of things that the Gentiles are guilty of. And, and there's just some, some heavy wickedness. Um, there's heavy immorality that's in there. There is the rejection of God as the creator. There's the turning to the world, turning to the creation and worshiping it rather than the creator. There is just a, just a huge list of things that, that are wrong with us and, and show how God would have been perfectly righteous and just goodness if he had just never dealt with us at all. But in the book of Acts chapter 17, in Acts chapter 17, as Paul is preaching, In verse 29, it says, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold, silver, stone, graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at. What does it mean to wink? Caroline just learned recently how to wink. You know what it means to wink? It means you close your eye, right? And that is how God is presented here. When Paul is preaching, he talks about the ignorance of the Gentiles. And he says that at the times of this ignorance, God winked at, or he closed his eye to it, or um, he winked as if he did not see them. Now, of course, God saw it, but, but because God is patient and because God is long-suffering, Paul could appeal to men and say, you know, God has turned a blind eye in patience to all of these things and commands us to repent. So it says at the end of verse number 30, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. It's amazing that, that when men, when we sin, God does not immediately call us into account for it, right? Knowing what we know about his holiness and his righteousness, it is a testimony to his patience and long suffering to his creation, 
that when we sin against him, he does not immediately call us into account for it. It's like he's winked at it. It's, it there are times that, that God is shown to have overlooked it. Not permanently, not forever, but in patience and in long-suffering doing so. Turn back a couple of pages, Acts chapter 13. God was patient to Israel. Israel was a stiff-necked people. And from the time they left Egypt until uh, the time that they crucified the Lord Jesus Christ, they were stiff-necked and hard-hearted people most of the time. And yet it tells us in Acts 13 and in verse 18, And about the time of 40 years suffered he their manners in the wilderness. God was patient with them. You would never be able to come away from the scriptures and God's dealings with individual people, with nations, with the Gentiles, with Israel, and say that he has not always been patient and long-suffering. God does not always, in fact, <laughs> the majority of the time, you would see he's patient. He waits. He is long-suffering in his dealings with people. And it's never an indication of his weakness. It's never an indication that uh, something was beyond his knowledge or beyond his sight. It's never an indication that he didn't have a plan or purpose with which to deal with such things. But we serve a God, and the God of the Bible is presented to us to one who has absolute, absolute control at all times. And within his nature... He has determined at times to wait and to be patient and to be long-suffering with a pitiful creation. Okay. It's a great, it's a great, a great blessed truth. It's a great attribute of God. It's a great to know that he deals with us in patience and in long-suffering. Right. We're going to, that's really what I wanted to cover this morning. There's, um, I don't really want to start the next point, um, because it's probably going to take an entire lesson itself. So let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Father, we're grateful to come today. We are thankful for your blessings on us. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to uh, be mindful of the God that we worship. We are so thankful that you're patient with us, that, um, that when we uh, deserve uh, else, we, when we deserve other things, Lord, you're merciful to us. You don't always uh, act immediately. Uh, the, the mind of God is, is such that it is perfect, it is righteous, uh, but it's beyond the, the weaknesses and the passions of men. And we are thankful for that. We're thankful that everything has a determined place and a time, and we're thankful to know that in this world, Lord, you're often patient with us, um, even in our error, even in our faults. And Lord, that spurs us to, to repentance, that spurs us to, to asking for forgiveness. I pray, Lord, that we would be, um, uh, that we'd be a people that could learn, uh, learn from that attribute uh, and learn to be more like you. I do pray, Lord, for the services today. I pray for Brother John as he preaches. Um, certainly, Lord, we need, to, we need a great understanding of your word. We need to know what it says. We need to know what it means. We need to know how to apply it into life. We want to be like Christ. We want to learn and grow as Christians uh, to be more of the people that we ought to be. And as he's studied and prepared, we ask, Lord, that you would uh, bring those thoughts out to us and, and give us understanding of your word. Help us to grow today as Christians. And be with them as they travel this week and as they go. We pray for Emily and Isaac. Pray for the baby that's soon to be here. Pray, Lord, for a healthy baby, a good delivery, uh, good recovery for Emily. And I just pray, Lord, that you'll bless uh, their young family, help them to serve you and bless their home. But do be with Brother John and Ty and the girls as they travel and as they go to be with them this week. Keep them safe while they're away. Many prayer requests that we have for those that have special needs, Lord, we ask that you'll bless, that you'll help them. Ask, Lord, that you would and, uh, give healing where it's needed, uh, give comfort, give provision for those that are lacking, Speak to the mind and hearts of those that are discouraged and need help. Help us to be a blessing if we can. I pray, Lord, for the next hour. Pray for these services today. All that's done, we want to give you praise and glory and honor.
If anything's accomplished, we know that it's through your goodness to us. We're not wise enough and we don't have the power and ability to change minds and hearts, but Lord, you can. We pray through the preaching of your word and the presence of the Spirit today. You would uh, help our minds to be directed to you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.